Hey, and welcome to um to another late night late TV fights. Um, we're here. We had another championship. Um, as you know, earlier um, Cody vacated his belt, so it left it wide open, and so we've got uh, Jay and Ryan here um, competing. Jay, how are you feeling about this match? Uh, well, I've said it earlier, and I'll say it again. Uh, peek behind the curtain. It is Star Wars Day, so I am excited. I'm ready to talk Star Wars. Wait, that's not what we're here for, son of a bitch. Okay, I'm ready to talk TV. It's all Clone Wars all day, all the time. No, <laughs> son of a bitch, those aren't the questions. Anyways, I'm just ready to yell at some people, uh, and I'm ready. Um, also here we've got Ryan. Um, Ryan, how's it going? Okay, um, I'm pretty much good. Just like, yeah, with I'm gonna read the same same thing with Jay. It's Star Wars Day, but at the same time, I've got like a pounding headache, so I want to hurry and talk before I literally forget everything <laughs> in my entire argument. And Jay just wins this by default. <laughs> I'm okay with that. Cool. He just said I went. He just said I win by default. We're good. We, we can all. Go. <laughs> if I pass out during this match, it's just because I didn't think <laughs> No, 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 no excuses. Let's just, I'm ready to fight. Uh, this has been a while. I'm looking forward to earn my first championship, and I'm excited for this, so I'm going to stop here because I have a tendency to talk too much. <laughs> um, and you just change yourself. But we've got some great judges here. Um, live from the cinema, we've got Kevin Poss. Kevin, how's it going? Uh, it's going well, and I, like you said, I am live from uh, from a certain cinema. I won't name it because they're not paying me enough. Um, maybe a free beer, and I'll, I'll give them a holler. Um, but yeah, uh, excited to see Star Wars, but ex- more excited to see these two fight it out. Um, and, and the other judge uh, we've got here is Jeremy. Jeremy, how's it going? Going pretty good, uh, obviously. They all want to see Star Wars, but I can't see it tonight because I'm a bum and a loser. So I uh, hope they enjoy it. I gotta wait. So uh, we'll keep it short and sweet. Uh, good luck to all the players. Uh, um, Jeremy, don't worry. I will uh, have you set up another uh, streamyard, and I will just point it at the screen. <laughs> <laughs> um, but. Um, how the show works is everyone gets an opening of 90 seconds, um, a middle of uh, five minutes, and a closing of one minute. Um, they have one extension that they can use on either the opening or closing, but I've got a feeling they probably won't use it, <laughs> but we'll find out. <laughs> um, going to s- start with Jay. Uh, Jay, you got 90 seconds on the clock. Time begins when you start talking for... Uh, the question is, what is the best legal drama? Everything's going wrong today. <laughs> uh, best legal drama. Uh, it's it's one of the ones that's been on the longest. It's uh, shit. What did I put as my answer? <laughs> it's gonna be it's gonna be one of those. It's it's one of those kind of days, fellas. It's one of those kind of days. Um. Oh yeah, I had Law and Order SVU, uh, Special Victims Unit. Um. It, it shows not only like the courtroom procedural process, but it also shows like the entire idea behind, you know, the, the, the cop's mind's eye in trying to track down somebody. So you get the best of both worlds. You get the um, cop action drama thriller portion of it, but you also get the legal drama aspect of it. And that's why I chose Law and Order SVU as uh, the best legal drama. Um. Ryan, um, you got nine seconds on the clock. Time begins when you start talking. Well, I picked for the best legal drama. I picked one that I was that I mainly synonymous. I mainly was I thought was synonymous with the word legal with the phrase legal drama, and that is Boston Legal. This show was a spinoff from the ABC show The Practice. It starred James Spader, William Shatner, Candace Bergen, and mainly the whole thing is focused on the law, the courtroom process. I mean, sure, these are like uh, lawyers who represent like high power people, but every now and then they represent the little guy. But most of the time, the drama of this show was among the lawyers and the firm itself. You had an interchangeable cast of characters. So almost every season, they always changed. You had new people coming in, new different stories to tell, new different morals to represent. And also, it was just all great fun. There was drama in the courtroom, but there was comedy amongst the fun amongst all these lawyers interacting with each other. And I'm going to stop here. Uh, Putting five minutes on the clock. 
Um, so those are some great openings. We've got five minutes on the clock for the main round. Um, time begins when you, someone starts talking. Danny Crane. Danny Crane. Danny Crane. Danny Crane. Danny Crane. Is there a point to that? It's literally all Bill Shatner has to say in that. This is a less funny Franklin and Bash. There's really nothing like dramatic about it. Like I think, the about? Most, I think the most dramatic thing that happens in this show is when James Spader gets fucking uh, diagnosed with mouth diarrhea. And then talking? even then, it's not even that dramatic. Like, you're what are you talking about? Danny like Crane. Zero drama. Okay, here's the thing. With Dan Crane's character, with this whole Danny Crane, Danny Crane, you get from the back that this guy is nothing but a selfish asshole. But, when he, but later on, he gets diagnosed with mad cow disease, which the show tries to use as a crutch for his mental illness. But ultimately, he's always been an eccentric character to follow. And also, his relationship with James, Spade, with James Spader's character shows you the ins and outs because they, these two are friends. They have different ideologies, different uh, political choices. They had focused one episode on the 2008 presidential election because these two men were supposing different sides, Danny Crane Republican, James Spader Democrat. Ultimately, in the end, these two still came together. But that's not just the point. The point is also about legal drama, the cases they always took in. Sometimes they would lose a case, sometimes they win a case. And it all came about how do they approach on their arguments, how the clients they represent. With SVU, you talk, you talk more about the, cops, the, the side of the cops point of view. You didn't mention a lot about the lawyers themselves. I mean, law and order has mainly always been synonymous with the cops. So when the lawyers do come in, they're almost seen as a second thought, except on the main Law & Order show, where they do share screen time. So it's called Law & Order SVU, and I explained that in my opening. If I need to go back and say what I said in my opening again, I will most definitely do that. You do get both sides with Law & Order SVU. <laughs> Is it more on the legal cop side, which would still make it a legal drama? Yes, it is. We all take we all took legal drama as a, a, a show that has to deal with cop or uh, with lawyers. What yes. I did was took the broader designation of what legal means, which gives you the best of both worlds. You get cops, you get bad guys, you get judges, and you get lawyers in courtrooms. What I'm saying to you is mm -hmm. there the best legal drama isn't a show that is filled with comedy for the best part and james spader is robert california he is the fucking lizard king put some respect on his name i'm just saying um but other than that when it really comes down to it yeah with a legal drama you do get a lot from shows like uh criminal minds from you know law and order you get a lot of that cop shit but that cop shit also pertains to the legal portion of it so i'm not just going to sit here and look for a dry type a dry type of show that's nothing but like a boston legal or an ali mcbeal type show what i'm looking for is something that gives me a little bit on both sides so i get a little bit of the cop i get a little bit of the courtroom and it's a nice okay. mesh i think that works really well no granted they may work well together but Law and Order, when people think about that show, if I were to talk to Law and Order about somebody, they would immediately think of the, the, the cases, the crimes that, you know, gets added onto the show where you do get the cop's point of view. And it might be a nice blend there. It might be a nice blend. But ultimately, when you get down to the final moments in the court case, you have all this buildup from the cop's perspective. With Boston Legal, though, as I mentioned, you get to see how these lawyers, the moment they take a case, you have to see them break down their arguments. They have to talk to opposing counsel of different law firms, depending on who they represent. They could represent murderers, wrongly convicted people, or someone who just cheated in a relationship and now is just trying to save whatever he has of his life savings or in divorce settlements. Okay. Boston Legal tackles pretty much almost any kind of court case coming across to, to where law, of, law and Order SVU is limited to exactly to what the show is, the Special Victims Unit. I don't want to say that's a negative, though, but when you try to brought, if you if you want range in a legal drama, sometimes putting something that's focusing on the lawyers gives you more room to start looking at what kind of court cases have actually I don't actually, I, I don't actually think that it does. I think you're actually stymied by that. 
because you don't get to see everything that happens. All you get to see is the interaction between the lawyers. It's not just the lawyers, though. It's it's not just the lawyers. It's not just their clients. It's everybody else involved in a case. And with something like Special Victims Unit, regardless of whether that's more of a pinpoint attack tile sort of thing, at least you get the involvement of the police officers. You get the involvement of other uh, witnesses, of other defendants. You get to see a wider range with a show like SVU than you do with a show like um, Boston Legal. Again, Boston Legal. Time. Uh, uh, damn, that flew by. Hell yeah, yeah bro. Honestly. Keep it up. <laughs> Let's keep um, it up. That, that was dope. But th that was a great debate. Um, now we're going to closings because Jay went first in the opening. Wine, you're going to go first on the closing. One minute is on the clock. Time begins when you start talking. Boston Legal is a great le is a good legal drama because not be because I mean it, because it focuses on the court cases the legal drama that happens behind the scenes. I mean I've constantly repeated on how lawyers have to approach a case and the one thing I did mention in my opening is the cast of changing characters. While you might get the heavy focus on William Shatner, James Spader, but you also got Candace Bergman who equals them out. And then you also get an overwhelming cast of characters from uh, Julie Benz. You also get uh, Gary Anthony Williams. You get, uh, Brad, oh, Brad, I forgot his last name, but Brad something. <laughs> but beyond that, the cast of changing characters gives you fresh perspectives. New people who have like these ideas new characters so where if you get a case of someone representing a murderer you get the lawyer who's all righteous who doesn't want to defend the murder but has to do their job the drama focuses on the characters and how they have to put their own personal morals aside and do the job while trying to advance in a law firm to for you know to advance their own careers and when they leave the show you see them come back being put on time the other side. <laughs> uh, jay you got one minute on the clock time begins when you start talking SV runs the gamut, whether it's just 100% sex crimes, whether it's drugs, whether it's murder, you get to see both sides. You get to see how the cops break down everything it is that they need to do to find and catch the person, the morally gray areas that they may or may not have to go to in order to catch that person. You also get to see the interactions between lawyers and how they have to be able to break shit down. So you do, you get both sides. You get the cop side, which is the action portion, which is a, what a lot of people watch TV for nowadays. And you get the legal side, which is something that, you know, the older generation really kind of like. So it, it works for multiple generations of people. You finally get to see not only how cops on the beat break stuff down, but you also get to see how lawyers break stuff down. And I think that's what makes a great legal drama. You get both sides of the argument. And I might be repeating myself, but I think that that's the one big thing that really helps that situation. I, I don't need to see all of this interaction between lawyers because at what point in time does that just become monotonous? At least with this, it breaks the monotony of that. And I get to see a little bit more on Again, both sides. I will yield the rest of my time. You finished right on time, so you didn't have anything to yield. Hey! <laughs> um, that was definitely a great debate. Um, I'm going to go to uh, Jeremy first. Jeremy, who should get the point and why? I'm going to give the slight edge uh, to Ryan on this one, simply because I think at the beginning, uh, the fact that Jay kind of forgot the, the answer that he was going to give kind of put him on edge a little bit. I think that kind of threw him off a little bit. <laughs> Ryan then jumped on him really quickly, kind of put him in a an, in defense mode rather than a kind of attack Ryan's choice. And I think they were kind of even on their closing. So because of that, because Jay was kind of having to play more defensive at the beginning, really didn't get a chance to put his case of his show over Ryan's. I think that really kind of gave uh, Ryan the edge. So my point goes to Ryan. Um, yeah, I'm going to go to Kevin next. Kevin, who should get the point and why? And don't forget that you muted. Thank you. Uh, my point's <laughs> going to go to Ryan as well. Um, Jay, you brought up a good point about SVU broadening the definition to of legal to cops, lawyers, and judges. But um, Ryan, you bringing up uh, the behind the scenes stuff, the cast, the changing characters, um, you naming the characters, um, the comedy drama aspect, um, and the uh, the. 2008 presidential election, like the the stuff that is happening in the world today, um, that that leans me towards your uh, your argument. So my point goes around. But I but now we move on to the next question, which is, um, what TV show should be cancelled? And this is definitely a big argument, especially with the answers that are given. But um, I'll let people, them 
um, announce it. Uh, Ryan, you're going to go first in the opening this time. 90 seconds is on the clock. Time begins when you start talking. Okay, this one's kind of difficult for me to find because when it comes to TV shows, there's always, there's always TV shows that always get canceled within their first season or before they even have a complete order for us to decide if we want to continue watching it. But keep looking when I kept looking for when I kept looking down within my soul I ultimately realized one TV show definitely needs to be canceled because it just can't keep continuing and that is family guy this show when it started it was over it you know it was on the edge you know it, it gave us it, it did like humor that was still funny to adults and to children it knew what it was from the start of it so we didn't have time to try to mash it down the hole I mean the show survived two cancellations which was a testament to itself but I think it needs to be canceled now because it's going on too long and some of the writing, some of the jokes, even the written dialect of the characters are starting to be like, not just unfunny, but ultimately kind of sad when you look at it. The show needs to be canceled because of the content that it keeps giving out, the fact that it has joke, set up, cut away, and then joke, it ultimately cuts the characters to where in a TV show, you want to see growth, which every time the show always ends up with characters ending in the same place. I'm going to stop here. Right. Um, Jay, uh, 96 is on the clock. Time begins when you start talking. Fox likes to suck the fun out of everything. I think a show that's been around for 672 episodes is by far the one thing that needs to be canceled the greatest, uh, the most. It definitely definitely has overstayed its welcome it is 31 seasons long it's been running since 1989 and it is the simpsons the simpsons just need to just disappear fade we've got it all all we need from you your show is overly long you've become nothing but a joke of your former self and all of your parodies are just parodies of other things you've already done. You're such the Simpsons is such a meta thing at this point in time that other shows are starting to mimic it and joke about it. And it's just becoming more and more unfunny. I think the Simpsons is the show that actually just needs to die. I think that's the one that they need to just get rid of. So we've got Simpsons versus family guy. It's, it's kind of like the setup for a crossover episode that has oh happened. But, <laughs> oh my god! <laughs> but oh. but um, the main round is um, <clears throat> um, but the main round has started. Five minutes is on the clock. Time begins when you start talking. Let's just agree on one thing: Fox have driven both of these shows to a certain length. We want to see them gone. But the thing is, with the Simpsons. I could maybe see this show for another two seasons because it, the, unlike Family Guy, this show has actually grown over its length. I mean, sure, they've removed characters that were a product of their time. And most people, and the reason why, and the funny thing of removing those characters like Apu kind of brought even more focus to the show because people are going, well, how are you going to continue the show now no. that this character's gone? That's that's not true. What brought that is the social justice aspect of removing a character like that brought more attention to the show than the actual show itself. Let's be real here. Your show has survived two cancellations. Your show has come back. There is enough of a demand for your show to continue that it has survived two cancellations. The Simpsons never been canceled in its entire run. And I think that right there, that gives my show the edge for the one that should be canceled. Your show faced such a backlash from Fox that Adult Swim picked it up and then FX picked it up. That show still has a very rabid fan base. But you know what you hear from every Simpsons fan ever? Man, this show was great for the first 20 seasons. And then, God damn, it gets hard to watch it. And you know what? I'm such a diehard for this topic right here. I've been watching the 30 seasons on mm. Disney Plus. Uh, Disney Plus, pay me. I will be a Disney show. Um, Plug. But <laughs> ultimately, it gets harder and harder to watch this show. At least with Family Guy, I can I know what's coming, but you know what? People want predictability. Are you well, sure about that? Because there are some shows that suffer from predictability. Insert CW shows here, or insert CBS shows. Insert ABC okay. We're not talking shows. about those though. 
but yeah, but what I'm saying but is, we're, but you, we're not talking about those. Though. We're we're yeah, talking about Family Guy, and we're talking about Simpsons. People yeah. want your comedy, and at this point in time, people the the right. viewership for The Simpsons has dropped dramatically, even though it's still on streaming services. Even the though comedy you're talking about, I want people are getting that from American Dad. They're getting it from Bob's Burgers. I mean, Family Guy. Unfortunately, sure, you might say people want demand for it, but when you start looking at the jokes or some of the stories they have behind the jokes, it falls flat. The care, I mean, let's take a look at Family Guy, the family structure there. Peter Griffin, an alcoholic drunk, Lois, uh, pretty much a uh, you know, a, a, a wife who's pretty much like uh, uh, suppressed because she has no voice. Meg, who's clearly being bullied by her own damn family. And Stewie, a character who started off as an evil villain character type has now evolved into someone who's mellowed out. And Brian, and Gr and let's talk about Brian, Quagmire, and Joe. These characters don't go through any significant changes. And when they do, three episodes later, they're back to their original selves. At least when they had an episode of Meg finally standing up to her family, Ultimately, she realized she's going to be the sacrificial lamb, take this abuse, all because her family doesn't know how to be mentally healthy. With The Simpsons, though, I prefer episodes when they have Homer being smart, and then you realize he's such a know-it-all that he drives people away from him, and ultimately, he wants to be loved by everyone else, which is why he chooses to go back to being dumb. Bart that's made it. one episode. That's 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 one episode you're speaking on. I I, now I will I will break it down to you like this. You you want a father who's an alcoholic. You want a mother who doesn't really get to talk. You want a daughter who gets bullied, and you want a son who's just there. Uh, you know what you're talking about. You're talking about The Simpsons. If if you really want to go there, that's Art's exactly what we're. There. No, but that's just it. That's exactly what you're talking about. You're, you're, you're talking about a family with one daughter and two sons and an alcoholic father and a mother who is obviously not being taken care of in any sort of fashion. Boom, you have the Simpsons. But you know what? The Simpsons have that like family guy doesn't. It's already been canceled and it's come back. There was such a demand for your show that it's come back. You want you dude, every I, there are 115 different movie references in the first four seasons of The Simpsons alone. And that's when it was funny. Once they started repeating that and it just became rinse, wash, and repeat, nobody cared. That's why the viewership has consistently gone down. It needs to die a natural death. I don't care so what cool. anybody else says about it. Yeah, it's still going. Not strongly, though. That's just it. But the simple fact is that Matt Groening was smart enough to get an 85-year contract with Fox, an 85-year contract with Fox, that they couldn't really do anything about it, shows you the fact that there was a giant demand for this show, and it has gone downhill to the point where even Danny Elfman, the original score creator, says that the show needed to be canceled. Granted, it doesn't really mean a whole lot, because yeah. he's speaking for a lot of the fans. A lot of people say that the, the show should have ended. Now, you were, what I'm okay. Uh, okay. No, go ahead. Uh, I, I, I read, damn it. <laughs> damn it. God damn. Ugh. <laughs> but there we go into the closings. Um, because one through to the opening, Jay gonna go through <clears throat> and yeah. Release the hell. Really, what it comes down to is the simple fact that we we have a show that has lasted so long and we have multiple reoccurring guest stars. It's just become predictable. It's become typical. And at this point in time, when we lose people, you know, we, we've lost several key voice actors to the show. We've lost key show runners. If people aren't surviving the show itself, I think that it starts to decline in quality. I'm sorry, when uh, I can't remember her name right off the top of my head, it's not Tress McNeil. It's... Um, it's, is it Marcia? No, it might have been Tress McNeil, the individual who played uh, Miss Krabappel. She passed away. A, a lot of people started to say that, you know, the show started to decline because that interaction between Bart and her was fantastic throughout all of the seasons. You know, you, you, you have a lot of wonderful things in the early seasons of the show. But once you see that, you can clearly see that right around uh, season 14, 15, it hits a peak and then it starts to just dive bomb. Nobody wants to see a show dive bomb and nobody wants to see a show that was once beloved by everybody become this joke of a thing. At this point in time, it just needs to time. go away. Um, Ryan, you got one minute on the clock. Time begins when you start talking. Let's 
Family Guy just needs to be canceled because the type of humor and the type of writing that this show has produced has ultimately ran its course. There was no foundation on, on this show to where it stands. Yes, it was canceled twice, but because of its shock humor. But the moment it kept being brought back, the writers needed to find a foundation for them to stand on. And the problem was that their humor of constant cutaway jokes, uh, you know, like dirty joke gags, or even just like certain attempts, like with Stewie always trying to kill Lois, that ran its course. Brian being a drunk, that's starting to run its course. Peter being so selfishly destructive to where he's hurting his family, it's to the point where you look in reality, this man should be dead. Now, Simpsons may have continued a long time, but at least it found a point to where they can survive. Family Guy has no point to where shows like South Park, American Dad are taking that humor that my opponent said the audience want, and they're still adapting. They're still changing it to where the audience can still want more episodes. Hell, Bob's Burgers and some of the shows on Adult Swim are doing that better. And most of the shows on Adult Swim are 15 minutes. And the fact that Family Guy needs to need an extra eight minutes to get their point across shows that this Time. show to be canceled. <laughs> I'm I'm going to go first on this one. Um, I'm going to give my point to Jay. Um, it was a great back and forth in battle, but I think the one point that Jay threw out there, which I don't think Ryan ki kind of um, countered equally, was the fact that he brought, Jay brought up that Family Guy's already been cancelled multiple times, but then came back. Um, so... For that I'll give Jay the point, but I'm not the only one here. Kevin, um, who are you going to give your point to? My point is going to go to to Jay, um, just because he he brought up the number of episodes. Um, the show has jumped the shark the shark at this point. Um, how it's become meta with other shows, um, twenty seasons, then it becomes hard to watch. Um, the uh, Ryan, I just don't feel like that you push back enough against what Jay I can tell Jay has has been rewatching a lot of these episodes um, with the 115 movie references and all that kind of stuff so it's just like he he had a little too much in the in the can um, losing the voice actors before the show's over uh, with Mrs. Krabappel that kind of stuff so my point has to go to Jay question number three is um, what is the best reality TV show um, and we're going to go back to Jay for his opening. Jay, you got 90 seconds on the clock. Time begins when you start talking. When I think of a reality TV show, I like to think of a TV show that doesn't have people saying, hey, you know what? We're going to go ahead and reshoot that. I need you to have more emotion. I need you to emote more. I want a show that actually shows the reality of what it is. That's why I actually chose, uh, it might be a little bit more out of the box, but I chose a show that when it's on, most people actually watch it. It's uh, the Antiques Roadshow. Uh, people have knickknacks in their house and they don't know if they're worth anything or not. And you can genuinely tell when somebody reacts to how much they think something's worth, whether it's got sentimental value to them or whether it's got like actual monetary value to them, they react. And it's a genuine reaction because these are real people. When it comes to other reality TV shows, I can't say the same. And I'll get into that in the five minute debate portion of it. Uh, Antiques Roadshow is my choice. Uh, um, why are 90 seconds is on the clock? Time begins when you start talking. With reality shows, let's be uh, to be uh, what people do want to see is the reactions. Honestly, with reality TV shows, they want to see something that's been building up. People actually being heartbroken, people laughing. They want to feel the joy to where it connects with audience. To where reality shows are unfortunately in our day and age one of the top few TV programmings. And one show that is definitely one of the top TV programmings is The Bachelor. Bachelor Nation out there. The fact that this show has spawned off many spinoffs, it is being viewed in, they have seven different versions of this show in seven different countries. And also the people that's been brought on there, they have to wear a certain, if let's say with a bat, it started off with the first Bachelor. <laughs> a man just trying to, trying to find love. And people were so ingrained to that. They were drawn so much into this. It developed show after show after show to where there has been like pre-show events, like, People want to see this. People want to know who's the bachelor. People want to know who's going to get their heart broken. People want to know who's going to end up together. And this show has had a lot of mistakes to where, you know, I'm going to stop here so we can get more into it. <laughs> uh, 
we've got two completely different reality TV shows. <laughs> so about five minutes is on the clock. Time begins when someone starts talking. Let me put it to you like this. What The Bachelor is is no longer a reality TV show. It might have been in its very first, you know, in its very first few seasons. But at this point in time, it's become so artificial. It's become so fake that there are literally people who work for the studios who are like, this is who he's going to end up with because it's an eight week shot. And then we get behind the scenes shit where they show that they have to reshoot certain scenes for it because the reaction wasn't good enough for them. That right there to me completely negates the fact that it's reality tv at that point in time you're literally just to you this girl. might just it might negate that but the fact they have to reshoot that i mean when you see the behind the scenes when someone when, one of the bachelor one of the one of the women that's not reality the bachelor, it may not be reality but the fact they're doing behind the scenes you're seeing the real reaction people are having the fact that this woman no we're not, not well that's just that's just it when we get the behind the scenes yes we are but when we actually watch the tv show no we're not and we're not talking about the behind the scenes portion of the it we're talking about the actual, the, TV show. the actual show shows people actually give a damn about this i mean it really doesn't though it, it just boosts sure? their ratings Yes, it just boosts their ratings because they don't show the genuine reactions of the people. They're like, oh, no, we have to reshoot the scene because that wasn't good enough. You need to emote more. That literally takes the entire steam out of your because show and your reality real TV people show. You clearly see. Real then that makes me, that, that's see. not a reality TV show. It's basically just a show where people improvise. There, there's no, it, it, it's basically a scripted TV show that's passing itself off as a reality TV show. There's nothing real about your show. At least with the Antiques World Show, everybody you see is actually having a genuine reaction. It might not be the most exciting TV show on the face of the planet, but you know what? A lot of people watch it. A lot of people watch a it. Lot before. Of people watch it. A Honestly, lot of people watch it before the uh, before the price is right. But you know what? A lot of people watch your show just to talk shit about it, about how fake it actually is. Your show you know, is just as bad as the Jersey Shore. None of those, neither one of those shows yeah. is actually a reality TV show. If that's not a reality TV show, this show it continues to still run. I mean, sure, people might know. Sure, you want to see people who. So does The Simpsons. So does The Simpsons. No, look, okay. Here's the thing with The Bachelor. Yeah, it started off as a reality show, and I still think it still continues because when you still get real people being brought into this situation where they're trying to find love because they're lonely, and you and you have this one guy who is clearly trying to decide who he wants to be with. Also, there have been moments to where actual people have dropped out of the show for legitimate reasons. In the seventh season of The Bachelor, a, a contestant had to drop out because she was going to lose her job. And in the 18th the season of there, The Bachelor, the guy who chose the girl actually ended up with somebody who he didn't choose. That's actually so, the like, second season. That's when it was it happened still, multiple. It happened multiple times during the show. That's just it. And at that point in time, they're literally just doing that for ratings. That's no longer a reality TV show because they're not showing the reality of what's actually happening. They're oh, like, no. this is the person. No, this is the person that they want. The world wants them to be with. So we're gonna go ahead and end it here. It's just like American Idol when no. uh, Ruben Stuttered lost out, or when Ruben Stuttered won. No, you know, it did like, why do you have to recreate yourself? I mean, Ruben Stutter was nearly eliminated a couple of times. But here's the thing. You want to keep talking about how fake my show is. Look, with Ant, at least the show is within the mainstream culture, the main pop culture, that people are still relevant and aware of it. With Antiques Rose Show, it has a minor following. I was aware of the answer you put down there. But the fact was, when I try to do research on this, I can't get a lot from this because not a lot of people are paying attention to this show. You say it comes it's on It's not that you Christ can't find it. It's that you didn't look hard enough. It's there, but it's not scrutinized like your show is because my show is actually real. It shows people in reality where your show is nothing but basically a scripted show where people are like, oh, hey, no, I like it when this person interacts with this person. So we're going to go ahead and force this. That it's takes clearly the, producing, it's clearly the chosen producers play. taking advantage of the audience. It's a reality TV show because everything. That's not reality. Then show the producer saying that. Don't show the producer saying that. It's That's literally what it comes down to because what you're what you're showing me right now isn't reality. It's an artificial semblance of reality. It's a simulacrum of reality, but it's not actually reality. Your show is fake. It's, yeah, the show is just as real as wrestling, just as real as sports commentary. I mean, wrestling really doesn't call it. itself real anymore, though. That's just it. If you really want to bring that up, it's sports entertainment. It's not a reality TV show. So at that point in time, call it a dating entertainment show because your show is not reality. Your Let's show is honest. fake as hell. 
people will still call this show a reality, no matter how many facts you it keep bringing up. Okay, so are we yeah, just are, they are we're not to... they're facts, they're not alternate facts, though. That's just it. No, I'm not it's... saying they're alternate facts. I'm saying even if you keep presenting this stuff, shit. <laughs> Good argument, bro. Good fucking <laughs> argument, dog. <laughs> Damn, this, is, this is literally a boxing match between us right now. <laughs> um, but um after that um great um middle when we get to the closings um because jay went first in the opening why are you going to go first on the closing one minute is on the clock time begins when you start talking since its inception reality tv has constantly changed amongst the times sure people when back then when the bachelor started my opponent does say that it has sort of devolved or it's been changed to the point to where it's considered fake or not actual reality but here's the thing with the bachelor you still have real people on this show sure if you're going to talk about the behind the scenes stuff you're still getting people not getting the actual reaction. Sure, not everyone is going to feel emotionally heartbroken because they haven't been picked. Some are going to move on. And The Bachelor, despite the fact everything is scripted, still has moments to where everything fucks up, to where people have to drop out of the show before it ends. People have shown surprising secrets to where one contestant on The Bachelor revealed that she was married to somebody in their sixth season when she went on to the show. One contestant showed that, of course, as I mentioned, she had to drop out because she had she did not want to lose her job. There's real people on the show actually risk putting their real lives on hold because they want this opportunity of love. And as I've mentioned, this show has been this has been shown. There's seven different times. Come fucking hell. Okay. <laughs> uh, Jay, you got one minute on the clock. Time begins when you start talking. One thing I would like to point out is that he never really had a chance to attack my show because we were too caught up in talking about the manufactured simulacrum of reality that his show actually I'm well is. aware of that. I am well aware hey, of that. Hey, <laughs> hey, this is my time to talk. <laughs> Anyways, we got so caught up in talking about whether or not his show is actually reality and he's caught the fact that his show isn't actually reality. We never got to talk about the fact that my show is actually reality. We actually get to see real people react and that's what I think reality TV is about and that's what makes it the best reality tv show not a tv show that has been forced that has been manufactured to get a response from people at that point in time you're literally just a nielsen rating you're not even looking for actual things and when it comes to the fact that you're you know it, it, it's been brought to the it's been brought to my attention that yeah certain real things happen in shows guess what certain real things happen in fake shows as well but my show is 100% real whereas yours is 99.8% manufactured i think that's Time. what makes my show better uh, um there's definitely a good battle i can't decide this song kevin you can get to go first <laughs> Thanks. <clears throat> uh, I did not see myself picking this as uh, the best reality show. Um, I'm going to go with Jay and Antiques Roadshow. Um, I I feel I got the feeling that uh, from that you know the real real it does equal the the reactions. And when I see that show, and and what I get from Jay from the from the hosts and the guests. The legitimate reactions uh, that those are those are real, um, and when you brought up the the wrestling thing, and uh, that that just completely killed everything about The Bachelor, um, because wrestling is sports entertainment. You say call it dating entertainment, and everything fell apart from there. So I got to give the point to Jay. Um, Jeremy, um, you, you can go next. Who, who are you going to give your point to, and why? I'm actually going to go with uh, Ryan on this one. And Jay kind of brought it up in the uh, in his closing. The fact that they spent a majority of the time with Jay trying to attack uh, The Bachelor, he really didn't boast his own show all that much until the closing. And during that brief time during the debate, one of the things he actually pointed out is, my show's not really that great in entertainment value. Well, to me, for to be the best reality TV show, there has to be something there. And he didn't really bring up a whole lot about his show during the debate. He kind of just attacked Ryan's choice. He did a little bit in his closing, but not really enough to me that put him over the top. He brought up the fact that people, you know, watch The Bachelor, whether to, to shit on it or boast on it. 
which means there's a whole lot more people watching Ryan's show than Jay's. Brian brought the fact that it has a, a, a minority uh, fan base antique road show. So I think everything that Jay did brought up get, did get countered by Ryan. So uh, I'm going to give my point to, uh, to Ryan. Um, so it means your fate lies in my hands. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, <laughs> but, um, but yeah, this was really tough because both the both um did a really good job. I'm going to give the slight edge to Jay on this um because I think Jay um, from the get go put um, Ryan um, onto the into the defensive um it, well it's not too much of a knock against Ryan because he did put up a really good argument for why the Bachelor should be considered the best. But I think um. Uh, but because he was put into the defensive um and that he didn't get a lot of the chat on a lot of chance to actually knock antiques road show um too much um so that's why jay's getting the slight edge but it was a really good debate though so anyway there's still um potentially um one more question at least um why does leave this one to stay in the in the game um but the next question is, talking about bachelors and people getting married at the end, we're going to go on to the next question, which is, what TV character would be the best person to officiate a wedding? Um, 90 seconds is on the clock. Ryan, I'm going to go to you first for your opening. And time begins when you start talking. Ultimately, when it came for me to pick a choice for someone to officiate a wedding, I need someone who is, when it comes down to the official itself, someone who's going to conduct this ceremony, you want someone who is authoritative, who can be able to, you know, be calm and cool under intense pressures, because at a wedding, anything can happen, who can be adept at it. You also need someone who is uh, kind, warm, and stern at times when you need them to be, and someone who's there to lend an opening ear and, and to provide some wisdom to you, I'm someone sorry. who will not judge you. And that person I chose is the character of Joe West from the TV series, The Flash. Joe West is a father figure to not only our main character, but his actual daughter, Iris West. He is a cop, so he knows how to handle himself in tough situations. And he has been, without a doubt, the best consistently written character on that show throughout every season because he's just there to lend an ear to you. Sure, he will make mistakes, which we have seen, but ultimately in the end, he's someone who will care for you, someone who will understand you. And as a flawed character, he is someone who has been where you are, at, who has been there, made mistakes, but have learned wise lessons in the end to also who I see who will end up loving you no matter what. And my pick is Joe West. Done. Uh, um. Jay, um, you're up. 90 seconds on the clock. If I want somebody who embodies love, if I want somebody who embodies loyalty, if I want somebody who is going to officiate my wedding, these are definitely things that I look for in my choice as officiant for my wedding. I've chosen Malcolm Reynolds, the uh, captain of the Firefly. This is literally a man who fought for a losing side because he was so loyal to it because he thought that it was right. This is a man that I would want to imbue those properties or at least bring that aura to what my wedding is. I want an individual who is willing to lay their life on the line to show that they love something because I believe that the person who officiates a wedding becomes a part of that wedding and uh, helps the people who are being married along the way, whether or not that it completely stops, whether they're family friends, whether they're a priest, whether they're a preacher, whatever it may be. I, I think that that person really helps. And with traits like that, that's something that you want in a wedding. You want somebody who's loyal. You want somebody who will love you. You want somebody that will fight for you every day. And I think that embodiment would help the people who are being married, especially if it's me. I would love to see something like that. So Malcolm Reynolds, the brown coat extraordinaire, is my choice. Uh, and 
Jay's trying to sway the judge's vote by um, picking a character with the same name as me, but um, about <laughs> five minutes is on the clock. Um, time begins when you start talking. You want to talk about someone being loyal? Like, uh, Jay, you're muted. I know. We're debating. I understand that. I'll unmute if I have something to say. Okay, fine. Well, if you want to talk about someone who is loyal, then that is Joe West. Because from the start of the show, the moment after the pilot, he discovers which, Barry which Allen. Joe West? Is the, Joe West is the... Uh, which, is Joe, the uh, which Joe West? I said from The Flash. Okay. The adopted which father West? of Barry Allen. Earth, Earth Joe two, West. Earth 6, Earth 13. There, Earth there are multiple... One, there are multiple you know there are exactly multiple what I'm about it here. doesn't matter. There are multiple incarnations of the individual that you're talking about. There's and only every one incarnation Malcolm is West. Still a love, and he is still There's only a one loving father. Malcolm Reynolds. Only one yes, this Malcolm Reynolds, he is someone it if you want him to officiate Wayne, fine. But to me, if I see Malcolm Reynolds there, I'm expecting him to run like a side deal in there. Like there's a certain guest he wants to do side business out of. I also see Malcolm Reynolds as someone who cool, that's extra money more. that I've got because if I have him officiate my wedding. Even if there is a side deal going on, guess what? I'm in on that. That means I get a little extra spending. He's going to be more focused on getting money. paid than he is going to in, that is, being that in is charge not true. of the wedding. I would rather Joe West, as a cop, is someone who is used to being in charge. So he knows how to handle Is he, though? Crap. Because he's not in charge. Is he? Yes, because he he's is really, in charge. No, he's really not. Is he he's commissioner? Adaptable. Is he, oh, is he yes, commissioner he Joe is West? Commissioner now? The, he is, yes. Now? Okay, fair enough. He didn't because need to be commissioner. Like he him. has the respect of all of his everybody on the police force. The commissioner before he became it respected him so much that he was a second counsel to him throughout the show. Joe West, as I've mentioned, he is a father, adopted father, and a loving father to his daughter and to a son he didn't realize he knew he had. And even then, he's being understandable. He is being patient. He's lending an ear. Malcolm Reynolds he is, is a, a father counselor. to multiple people on multiple people on the crew of the Serenity. He is a love interest to one person on the Serenity, but he helps everybody out there. Let's he's be only real a father here. to one person on that crew. <laughs> he's the best friend to everybody else. No, 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 no. Yes. Let's be real. No, let's be real here. He fathers Kaylee out the ass. He also no, we're we're, we're not gonna yeah, get there. Kaylee. Okay. No, I mean father fatherly stuff is important because of Joe West as his experience as a dad. Like no, I no, 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 no. It's it, it's not just Kaylee though. That's just it. If you want to go well. more into Malcolm Reynolds and fine, I will talk more about Joe West if I want to. The fact well, okay. is well, isn't that what we're doing? This is a debate. Yes, but the fact you don't want to stand up for Malcolm Reynolds and I'm willing to stand up for Joe West means that you really have. I literally just tried, it. and you keep cutting me off. I don't but know what you're I talking give about. You your time. I'll give you your time. Thank you. What it really comes down to is the simple fact that you want somebody who is loyal to do this. Yes, Joe West is loyal to a degree on one earth, but there are multiple incarnations of this individual where he's really not. We 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 can go into the let's go to another earth situation here in a minute. But there's only one Malcolm Reynolds, and guess what? Loyal to his crew, 100%. If he gets backstabbed, that's one thing. But I think if anybody gets backstabbed, they'd be a little bit, they'd be a little bit vindictive. So, but if I want, no, go ahead. No, 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 no. I was listening. No. But if we're literally going to talk about what we'd want as an officiant, I'd want somebody. Nobody's 100% good. It, it doesn't matter who you are. Evie, we're not going to bring religion into this, but nobody's 100% good. And I'd much rather have somebody who shows the fact that they're not 100% good preside over something than somebody who puts on this air of, hey, I'm the good guy. Then I'm let's talk loyal. about the alternate versions of Joe West. Talk about. In Earth 2, he loves the dark iris, but you see that he's not ultimately good because he has ultimate disdain to the Earth 2 Barry. Now that, because from his perspective okay. as a father, he doesn't like the fact that his only daughter, who he saw a bright future for, get, chose to become a cop to support <laughs> a boyfriend he's not ultimately sure about. He ends up dying because of the line of work his daughter does. And because he, and even in the end of his deathbed, no matter what, even when Burry was there, he still said to him he has ultimate respect for this character. And every time he was there as a lounge singer, he was there because he had the love of his daughter. Every that line he said, every time I was going to perform, I said to myself, This one's for you, Iris. He this eternal love he has for his daughter is a testament to his character. So he's That's got he's got love for one character, though. That's just it. 
that's just it. Okay, so if, if we're going to talk about somebody as an officiant for a wedding, then I need somebody who is able to show a nicety to both sides, regardless. And now we're bringing in multiple people. You said it yourself. That Did these you guys just mention disdain. you wanted someone? Hold on, to hold, on, hold, on hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. I'm not talking about good or evil. What I'm talking about is disdain shown for a character. Um, and your character. Wow. <laughs> that one went by so fast. Yeah, we're close. I am close. We are cl scratching and right. clawing here. Right. But, but um, now we go to our closings. Um, and uh, Jay, you go first in the closing. Time <coughs> limit t starts when you start talking. All right, again. Uh, I picked Malcolm uh, Reynolds because he's a man that embodies loyalty and love. Loyalty to a cause that he knew that was right and it almost killed him. Loyal to his crew. He loves his crew and his ship and would do anything to protect them, all of them. And I think that those are the type of people that should officiate weddings. They put a little bit of their own personality and their attributes into the people that they marry. I, I think ultimately that's a fantastic idea. And I think that that's what almost any officiant to a wedding does. Mm and there's only one of them. We don't have to worry about another one from another earth breaking in and saying, ah, no, I love my daughter, but I don't like the guy that she's marrying. And yeah, I would much rather have somebody, if I knew that they didn't like me, still at least respected me and put me at the forefront because they respected the choice of the person that I was marrying. This is why I want somebody like Malcolm Reynolds to actually be the officiant at my wedding. I don't need somebody who's going to sit here and be like, ah, there, there might be 14 other people out there who really don't like you, but I'm going to be the one to marry you because... Yeah, that's that's what the timeline dictates. Uh, time. Time. <clears throat> All right. Ryan, one minute is on the clock. Time begins when you start talking. My opponent constantly keeps bringing up the, the, the thing of his character is that he is loyal to a fault, and that is exactly Joe West. Sure, on alternate Earths, he may not like the person who uh, is going to be married or in a couple, but he still has loyalty. I mean... Without a doubt, the fact that he's a dad and he's loyal to his daughter shows to me that this there is room for a growth of this character. And throughout the sea, on Earth One, he's not just a father figure to Barry and Iris. He becomes a father figure to Cisco. He becomes a father figure to Caitlin. And he's so protective of them. So whenever their lives are in danger, he will immediately hound you. He will threaten you. And sure, he's a flawed person, as I have mentioned before. But it's his flaws that show that there is still room to grow with this character. Malcolm Reynolds has love for his crew. And, as he, and he's clearly shown that. Anyone outside of his crew, he is always on edge, always distrusting. And sure, to, if you're part of this man's crew, you'll love him. But when it comes to the characters of River and her brother, Simon, let's be honest. Malcolm has been on walking on eggshells with them throughout the first season of Firefly, even on screen. Um, uh, um, Jeremy, you're going to start with you. Um, who should get the point? <laughs> This is kind of tricky um, because it was something that Jay brought up that I, I thought was interesting because he brought up the line, not every character is 100% good, which I thought was interesting because then he kind of used um, Ryan's character against that and kind of tried to spin it off and, and attack the character because of that. So I thought it was kind of weird. So it's like not every character is 100% good, yet you're trying to use that against Ryan's character. I thought that was weird. Um, so ultimately when it came down to it, Jay brought up the fact of the, the split personalities, you know, alter alternate reality people. And I felt Ryan did enough to prove that there, yes, there are flaws as Jay brought up about you know, what that implies. But ultimately I thought Ryan did enough to defend his character to that point. And I felt Ryan did a couple more cases to prove why his character would be more worthy of this position. So I'm getting slight edge uh, to Ryan on this, although it was very close. Uh, Kevin, who are you going to give your point to and why? Um, this was super close. Um, and I saw exactly what Jay was trying to do there at the very beginning with which Joe West. Um, but Ryan did not fall into that trap. I'm giving my point to Ryan. Um, he he laid out Joe West in a good way, um, and the kind, warm, stern uh, laid out the room for growth, but still the father figure, not judgmental. That's who I'd want um, 
to to officiate my wedding. So um, my point goes to Ryan. We are tied. It's going down to the final question, which I'm pretty sure is the one Jay really wants to argue. <laughs> oh. The la- final question is, who is the best animated TV character? Um, and um, we're going to start back off with Jay. No, Ryan. Um, so, Jay, 90 seconds is on the clock. Time again to start talking. When I look for who was the best animated TV character, I look for somebody who can bring me advice, somebody who can give me a little bit of comic relief, somebody who can bring dramatic tension to something. Um, and two people have done that. Um, and they've both played the same character. Um Martin Baldwin and uh, Mako have both portrayed uh, Ira from uh, Avatar The Last Airbender and into uh, Avatar Legend of Korra. Um, This character has been a father, a grandfather, a sage-like individual, an individual who has shown that he can bring war, he can bring destruction, he can bring pain, but he can also bring peace. He can also bring solace. He can bring the good and the bad. I believe that Iroh is the greatest animated TV character of all time. He's just literally one of the best people. Uh, I will yield the rest of my time. Um, Ryan, you got nine seconds on the clock. Time begins when you start talking. When I saw of the best animated character, of course, so many came to my mind, but ultimately it came down for character, their journey from the show, from beginning to end. or And when it came down to it, the character I saw who had a very sympathetic and a very relatable uh, growth, and that is the character of Gohan from Dragon Ball Z. From the moment this young boy was propped from just having a normal life with his father, all of a sudden... He gets kidnapped by his uncle. He is thrust. He- and then afterwards, his father dies. He's kidnapped by his greatest enemy, the train to protect the earth. And from there, this whatever sense of normalcy that this boy had was gone to where he has had he has gone to separate alien planets. He has seen friends, loved ones die, all because he doesn't feel he's strong enough to protect them. This need fuels his anger. And it's the fact of that when you, the moment he, be, and you see moments when he finally starts stepping up, you want him to take over. But it's the fact that this kid was not raised right by his parents or wasn't given a sense of discipline. He struggles with much use, like in teenage, when you're a teenager or a pre-adolescent, just the idea of trying to cur- understand your anger, trying to control it, trying to control your passions to, Ultimately, when you see him further down the line, you see this man who is calm. He ha- he's a loving family man. He has walked away from fighting to where he is using his mind to create a future for his family. And while, and just like with so many other characters in Dragon Ball, he is once again. Time. Shit. Uh, yes! Okay. I think you mean crap baskets. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's do this. Um, but now we're going to the main round. Five minutes was on the clock. Time begins when someone starts talking. Hey, I got a, I got a question for you, Ryan. What makes a character great? Is it that he knows he has great power and then decides to not do anything with it? Or is it a character that knows he has great power and then continues to try to help out? That can go either way. Honestly. It really can't, though. That's just it. And that's the thing with Gohan. Gohan completely gives up. He becomes one of the weaker characters. He, he literally you know, he literally stops having a thrive for it. You know who doesn't do that even after death and yet can't be wished back by a couple of fucking Dragon Balls? Iroh. Iroh Gohan has out. never been wished back. He has never been wished back. And yes. I never said did. that Gohan got wished back. Yes, but he, he may have stepped away. That's because he stopped the ultimate threat of Cell. His father chose to stay dead, which was mainly the core why their lives were such hell. The fact, Gohan got to live a normal life. 
Yes, because after Gohan, because di- after Goku died, we see Gohan as teenagers. We see him grow up. He is just normal we, now. We he see him grow up and become identity. jaded and no longer protect the earth. He's we not see him become a normal human being he is at who peace. no longer wants to. Da- he says he no longer wants to do what he's doing. Exactly. But what he, he never wants to do as a child. Life. This life of was course. forced on him. He never chose of- it. Of course. So when he chooses to go back to being a normal character and forsakes the entirety of humanity to everything that happens in outer space, yeah, no, I'm I'm sorry. What would you rather have? Would you rather have I'm sorry. What I would rather have is somebody who saw that his nephew was cast out unfairly, still tried to make him a man, got betrayed by that person, and then still ultimately forgave him, helped the avatar, helped his nephew, helped everybody bring down his own brother to create peace, and then when everything became chaotic again, came back to help. That's what makes a great character, not a character who there's two different situations between them. I wrote throughout the entire of the first of Avatar: The Last Airbender. There's been nothing but wartime. With Dragon Ball Z, we at least get to see moments of peace to where Gohan can try to figure out who he is. To when we come back, can he? No, no, he can't because he's always got somebody that's forcing something upon him. So when he exactly. finally chooses that's why. normalcy, never, yes. when he cho- when he chooses normalcy, he is forsaking everything it is that he knows that he needs to do because he's doing exactly what his mother wants him to do. So he's not his own character. He doesn't have his own relevancy, at least with Iroh, a man who, after he lost his son, said, I don't want no. the throne. There, the thing but was, I will go yeah, on the futile quest. Oh, I'm sorry. I I'm agree sorry. with you. His mother did force the books on him. But just like with every overbearing parent to a child, the mother wants something better for them. Goku, the biggest flaw of Goku is he's not present. And it's, if, it extremely affects Gohan to where he can't control his anger. When he becomes Super Saiyan to fight Cell, he doesn't know exactly how to handle himself there because nobody taught him how to handle it. And exactly back in the Majin Buu era, it's finally his time to step up. Nobody taught him how to control himself when he's that powerful. So when he does become normal and super, he has his reasons for doing that because he knows he does not have the mental stamina. He does not have the mental balance to control himself. With Iroh, he's already someone who's experienced faults. He's more of a wise mentor to a Gohan. We are, you can insert yourself into his life and try to look at Iroh everything. Iroh creates the better character. I'm sorry. Iroh creates the better, best animated character because you already get to see him at his, it, 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 this is, this is rise, fall, rise again. I don't need to see rise, 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 fall, and then nothing. I would much rather see somebody with at least a little bit of character death. And with Iroh, you actually get that because you get somebody who was known as the Dragon of the West, the man who was supposed to conquer Ba Sing Se. His son died. There's a little bit of character development for you. You get to see it when Iroh helps the little children. You get to see it when he helps the uh, the robber. And you get to see it when he has that emotional moment when he sings uh, leaves from the vine, falling. So, so. You, you get to see it. And then you get to see him help ultimately the one person that he never thought that he could redeem. That's what makes him a great character because he is not the person who needs redemption, but he's yeah. the person who helps somebody find redemption. And it's not just with his own family. It's also with the other avatar years later that he helps Korra realign herself so she can become the most realized individual there. You want a wise hermit character? We're not talking about Yoda here, but we're talking about Iroh, a man who has been able to do that. And, and that's that is what makes great, great for a side character. But if you want someone who's brought, who's taken from side into the focus, throughout Dragon Ball Z, they were trying to prep Gohan to become the new lead, the new focus. But the fact that Gohan, in that moment when Cell is pushing him, pushing him, Gohan never had a angry. choice. Iroh did exactly. That's why Iroh did. did like with so many. Oh, Iroh man. did. <laughs> uh, as much as I hate to push it, because I have like eight minutes, I'm going to use my minute extension on this one. Oh, you son of a bitch. <laughs> I'm sorry, brother. I'm sorry, brother. I, I love you, bro. I love you. This, is, this has been fantastic. I, I would love to have this off screen on another day. Uh, Yeah, no, I will definitely use my minute on this. No, then I'm going to, too. I'm almost like, I'm also like eight minutes shy, so I'm going to use my minute. No, no, fuck. Yeah, I'm going to use it. I'm going to use it. All right. <laughs> um, both players are using the web extension on the closing. Um, uh, uh, you got to start well, with Ryan, because I started. Yeah, yeah okay. it's, I was getting there. Um, I remember that <laughs> Sorry, part. <laughs> uh, my two minutes on the clock. Time begins when you start talking. 
Now, the most fan conception of Gohan is that he's seen as a weak character, someone who was given this opportunity and chose to throw it away. But when you start to relook at Dragon Ball Z, the moment he is introduced, there is already a set future for him by his mother, Chi Chi, because of Goku. He has done nothing but fight his entire life. And you see the fact that Goku, his heritage, his, his legacy, his race, Everything that falls onto him ultimately affects Gohan. As I've mentioned, Gohan was kidnapped in the first season, not once, but twice. Gohan has had no, his life was forced on Gohan. He has had no choice but to fight back. So when moments of peacetime comes, Gohan gets an idea of self-reflection, his self-identity. He gets to see what he has, who he has, and what he's going to do about it. So when finally he does defeat Cell, he lets go of all of that frustration, that anger and resentment he holds towards Goku and to everyone else who's pushing him. When he, when you see him in his younger years of going to high school with Videl, you see relationship buzz there because Gohan, he's assured of who he is as a character. The great Saiyan man might seem as goofy, but guess what? That's just Gohan channeling that same fight, that same heritage of fighting into something positive. Even in Super, sure, he looks like a nerd, but guess what? It's the fact that Gohan is an empathetic and a warm character. He gets to have a true happy ending, a happy ending of his choice. He chooses to have a wife. He chooses to have a daughter, to choose to live a life of the mind, of just with studying and research, because it challenges him more in life than fighting will ever do. And when he ultimately has to become a fighter again, he knows what's driving him. He knows exactly what to fight for. So when in the tournament of power, when he sacrifices himself, he knows what his role is and how to fulfill that role. Not more of, I'm going to be the best. It's because he knows exactly who he is, and it's because of Gohan's choice to know that he may never be at the top, but he still wants to fight to protect the people he care about. I'm going to stop. Um, well, you better stop because that was like exactly two minutes. Oh, holy <laughs> crap! <laughs> <Damn>. <laughs> um, Jay, two minutes oh. on the clock. Time begins when you start talking. Iroh, the Dragon of the West, the Grandmaster of the White Lotus, is an individual that not only helps his own family, but helps the world entirely to a whole. He helps defeat his own brother. He helps the Avatar. He helps almost, he helps every single member of Team Avatar. He has given selflessly after being such a selfish individual. And you hear about it and you get to see that he is a selfish individual. And you get to see that character become less and less of a selfish individual. You get to see the fact that he actually grows and gives everybody sage-like advice to the fact where he is one of the only human beings who's ever been granted the fucking ability to be an actual person in the spirit realm in Legend of Korra who helps not only Korra, but everybody else in the spirit realm. This is a man without... This, this is a man that if you took out of a TV show, Aang would have failed. Zuko would have failed. Cora uh, would have failed. Katara would have failed. Toph would have failed. This is an individual who is, yes, a side character, not a main character, but even with all of that, is still one of the greatest characters of all time because he knows that he is not a main character, but he's still there to offer the best advice possible to every single character to progress everything it is that's necessary. Whereas my opponent has chosen somebody who, when he had a fucking life, decided, oh, hey, no, I'm, I'm done. I don't, I don't want to do any of this. And then it ultimately came to it that he probably could have survived had he actually trained. He just said, no, I'm going to be a fucking nerd and start a family. My character has started a family, lost a family, created another family, and then died peacefully and still continued to help everybody. That's what makes him the greatest animated TV character. Iroh is the correct answer. Uh, um, this was so, um, so tough. It was such a great battle. But Kevin, who are you going to give your point to and why? Oh, man. Um, this is a really tough one for me. Uh, I'm not super familiar with either of these, so I kind of came in blind. Um, so I'm going to go off of just the arguments. Um, Jay, I'm going to give the point to Jay. Um, in the closing, he brought up the growth of the character. Um, he did talk about the uh, the rise, fall, rise, as opposed to rise, 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 fall. Um, <clears throat> and he gave the best possible advice while living 
as opposed to um, Gohan apparently just giving up. Um, so I'm I'm just give, I'm gonna give my point to Jay. Yeah, this was um, this was definitely tough. Um, and, and just like you, Kevin, I was kind of in the dark with both these shows. I've only just started watching Avatar. And I've never bothered Dragon Ball Z, but um, yeah, based on the arguments, um, I'm gonna give the slight edge to Jay. Um, he did he made it like it was a like really tough it all just came down to a few things that, and i've been uh, and for me it was, it was just pretty much just like what kevin said it was the point where um where with J- when jay said that the character of iro um actually grew um as a character over the series well gohan never really got that growth too much but um which means and the winner and you late TV fights champion, Jay the Arsonist Burns. You mean it's not the rank of champion? <laughs> <laughs> um, but um Jay, how do you feel about capturing the belt? Oh man, this is not the one that I thought I would actually win on, but I'm so glad that it went to the final question because this is the one that I actually prepared for. This was fantastic. Ryan, I would we we talked for like an hour and a half, two hours the other night after the other match that happened. Um, I love talking to you, buddy. You, you've got some really great ideas, and I can't wait. Hold on one second. I'm in the middle of something. I know. I'll be right there. Start the car. <laughs> two minutes. Literally, I'm being ushered out the door. Star Wars night, y'all. Uh, this was fantastic. Ryan, love you. Malcolm, thank you. Uh-huh. Kevin, thank you. Uh, JTH. Uh, I love the fact that you sponsor a wheel all the fucking time, buddy. Yeah. Uh, I, I love you guys. I got to go. Uh, this was mad fun. Oh, yeah. It's weird being a fucking champion uh, because now I'm going to have to fight people I like. And not that I didn't just fight somebody that I like. Uh, Ryan, I will fucking rematch you any day, maybe for a title, maybe not. But uh, yeah, this was this was mad fun. See you later. Um, but Ryan, you didn't manage to capture the belt, but um, how do you feel about how you debated today well it was uh throughout this match i was clear that uh yeah going up against jay was a tough hill i definitely got back in the corner so many times uh well definitely when i do step back into the ring again in late tv fights i will reevaluate certain choices i pick so they're actually defendable like with the third question even though but beyond that um yeah, just like Jay, I also have time to rush. But ultimately, I do think that this was in- in- incredibly fun. I'm glad that we got to the fifth round because I, too, researched on this. I mean, I didn't bring up enough facts that Jay did for his character. I guess for me, when it came to that question, I felt more of to, – to me, it felt more of the story arc of an animated character to which I'm drawn to that makes me want to rewatch the seasons over and over and over and over again, which is why I like Dragon Ball Z because so many characters have different perspectives to where you see them end up. But I do, I definitely want to play Jay again sometime in the future. It's going to make me even want to climb even higher and higher up that ladder for next season on late TV fights to get that belt. Or hell, I might get it. I might find Jay in another arena. But just like him, <laughs> I have to hurry and usher out. I got to pick up some people. And then like an hour later, I got Star Wars. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, um, I do have plans for the start of the year. Um, I think there's plans for a. Um, title defense in um, February, so, um, and I've got plans for the people that's probably going to be in matches to get there, but um, there's not time to go over it now, but um, but from all of us here at Late TV Fights, for Jay, for Ryan, for Kevin, actually, um, Kevin, how do you feel about how the match went? Oh, uh, I think it went great, man. It was uh, it was definitely a championship caliber fight. Ryan, I've I've played him or debated him before. I know how great he is. Uh, Jay obviously is amazing uh, behind the mic, so uh, I knew this was going to be awesome, and it, it didn't fail to uh, to to bring it. Neither of them failed to bring it. And JDH, how do you feel? Um... How the match went? Uh, I thought the match re- really, uh, really good. Uh, a lot of choices that uh, didn't see coming, so I was really interested to see where everybody was going to go uh, with uh, with their debates. Uh, hope everybody uh, liked and agreed with uh, how I uh, just went with uh, each uh, 
question. It looks like I got approval from each one. So, uh, yeah, uh, ultimately, I uh, really enjoyed this. I'm not uh, really into the uh, judging outside of the, uh, the choke slam stuff. So, uh, really, um, really enjoyed this match. Uh, hopefully, I can uh, judge more often in these. Yep. But um, for all of us here, we'll um, see you next year. Um, hope you all have a great Christmas and a happy new year. And we'll see you probably looking around end of January to come back. Um, but yeah. Um, so from all of us here, uh, don't change that channel. <laughs>